Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Khaled Abdel Halim. I would like to, uh, I'm going to moderate this session. I would like to thank uh, the City Debates uh, organizers for inviting me and having the honor to be the moderator for this session. I'm particularly uh, happy to moderate this session on um, displacement and resistance. Following the interesting presentations and the raised questions yesterday and today on the strategies of counteracting gentrification and the importance of documenting, disseminating, and uh, analyzing the reactions of residents uh, subject to the forces of and pressures of displacement or eviction. So this session is particularly about that. We have three researchers reflecting on resistance and to gentrification in two important cities in the Middle East, Istanbul and Cairo. And that follows a uh, last session that covered also Beirut, which is a very a third very relevant city to this subject so um, just to start starting with our first speaker i introduce uh, dr uh, bahar sakizli oglu uh, who is on top of the subject of gentrification and displacement from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective covering urban development social justice and politics she is uh, presenting a paper titled Residents Displacement Experiences in Istanbul. Dr. Um, Saki Zlu Oglu, master degree on the impact of urban renewal in Istanbul and her PhD on citizen, citizens displacement comparative study uh, in Istanbul and Amsterdam are an evident of her interest in the subject. Her research interests and publications also covers uh, uneven urban development, gender and social movements, and the politics of gentrification. So, uh, Dr. Bahar, please, you have the floor. Um, I will ask each of the speakers to try to be confined to 20 minutes presentation uh, so that we can allow time for uh, discussion. I will introduce my other two speakers uh, before they start their speech. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, um, and I especially want to thank Obier for the logistical support. That was really great. Thank you. And um, I'm happy to meet all the new friends here in Beirut and learn about the city also. And um, I finished my PhD on residents' experiences of displacement in Amsterdam and Istanbul last year, and I'm now preparing to start a new project on um, how gender and space are constituted during the process of gentrification later this year. Let me start, and um, today I will present you a paper, just to correct that, I will present you a paper which is called um, the um, ins Inserting Temporality into the Analysis of Displacement Studies, Living Under the Threat of Displacement. Um, let me start with this long quote from a resident living in, used to live in Tarlebush, the designated area. And it also refers to what Ryan was talking about, the dying of Istanbul. And he was saying they killed the neighborhood. The city is not dying, but it is being killed. And um, there is no one but the thieves, drug dealers, and we don't know what to do anymore. We have to stay... We have to stay put around here, and we can't afford that. And the context he said this was after six years of living under the threat of displacement in Tarlebushi, which is a very central neighborhood in, in, in the middle of Istanbul. And he's a Kurdish owner-occupier street seller. And um, the story of Aziz and many others who have lived under the threat of displacement signal a gap in the growing literature on state-led gentrification and displacement. There is little attention on the process of change in these neighborhoods and um, how residents live under this threat. In this presentation, I will address this gap, uh, focusing on the trajectory of neighborhood change in neighborhoods targeted for gentrification, and in this case, by the state as the agent of this gentrification, and discuss how residents live under the threat of displacement. Um, what is on the agenda? is, yeah, 
first I will provide a conceptual note on displacement and we'll discuss the need for developing a more comprehensive uh, approach to displacement, to study displacement. And I will then present the case study of Talibashi, Istanbul, where residents lived under the threat of displacement for, for, for more than six years. And I will end up with concluding remarks and I'll try to uh, connect these points to the points earlier made in this conference and raise some questions also for debate. And displacement can be defined as a forced residential move induced by external forces or events beyond the control of household. And two different forms, public sector displacement and private sector displacement. I will not go into the details of um, four types of displacement uh, Peter Marcuse defined years ago, but let me just make the critique of the existing studies which usually make use of available quantitative data to investigate the lost resident displacement. And these studies take a snapshot in time, a point in time before or after displacement to investigate the impacts of um, impacts on individual households. And this sort of pre move and post move analysis does not take into account how a certain neighborhood changes after it is targeted for renewal, or how these changes are experienced by the residents living under the threat of displacement. In other words, the story of Aziz and many others are not covered by this literature. To develop a comprehensive approach to displacement, first, we need to focus on displacement as a process and look at changes that take place, uh, that, that take a consecutive period of time to happen, as Burnt and Holm um, discuss it. And this would help us understand not only how the residents are affected, even before the actual displacement starts, but also the, um, um, the pressures that the state and the landlords put on them. And the appropri these appropriation uh, strategies of the landlords and the states include first the negotiation strategies, intimidation, threats and harassments that the residents become exposed to by the landlords and authorities who push for gentrification. And secondly, the use of time by the state, as Burio would say, the exercise of power over people's time, appears to be a crucial to uh, tool for states' coloni colonization and appropriation of space for gentrification. For instance, through spreading rumors, uh, rumors of renewal, which raises expectations, creating uncertainty and delaying decisions, demolitions, the state puts pressure on the residents. And the same goes for the state's power over information regarding urban renewal and how it uses it to manage this process of uh, displacement. Second, next to the role of time, we need to rethink the role of space in understanding, uh, in our understanding of displacement. As Davidson 2008 discusses, um, existing quantitative studies of displacement usually reduce the meaning of um, displacement to residential relocation. There's little attention for placemaking practices, meanings of home, community building for people, who are directly affected by the process of displacement even before the actual displacement takes place. In other words, this social spatial phenomenon is being reduced to a spatial phenomenon and ignore how gradual destruction of homes, communities and neighborhoods affect the disadvantaged groups long before the actual displacement takes place. And putting these two points together, I will give an account on residents' experiences of living under the uh, threat of displacement, discussing firstly how the residents um, experience the changes in their neighborhood, like for instance the moving out of neighbors, changing the profile of commercial shops, and changing the public services, etc. And the second, appropriation strategies of the state and the landlord. Okay, now let's proceed with the case of 
İstanbul, Tarlabaşı. I will not go into the details because you hear uh, about this part a lot, I guess, from Tolga. But to start with the political history of urban development in Istanbul. Istanbul experienced a populist clientelist period till the 80s, which was, um, which continued with the gradual neoliberalization, and then what I call the radical neoliberalization in 2000. And um, let me just talk about the bottom line of this political history of urban, re urban development. How the power, um, this history shows how the power balance between residents on the one hand and authorities and developers on the other hand shifted in time and the decisive favor of the, um, of the developers and authorities. And in the contemporary period, the state became an active agent of Of, of gentrification processes that are brought about by the um, urban transformation projects. Urban transformation projects cover many areas, but I will focus on the renewal of historical areas in this presentation. And it's crucial to discuss the new renewal law for this, to understand this context. This new renewal law, it has a really long name, I will not even translate it now. It gives the, the right to local municipal, the right um, to the local municipalities to designate renewable areas in the historical areas uh, in their jurisdiction and make projects with or without partners that could be private and at the same time public. And it arms the local municipality with the right to expropriate properties, um, the owners of which don't agree with the terms of the project. So it gives a lot of power to the local authority, which is then used for the, for the private um, partners. So it doesn't give, um, another point is that it doesn't guarantee a relocation house or compensation for the people affected. And it leaves all these issues to the discretionary power of the, of the local authorities. Okay, if I start with the case of Tarlabaşım, Talavish is a deprived inner city neighborhood in the northern part of Beyoğlu. It used to be a lower middle income, non muslim minorities neighborhood. I will not go into the details. Now it is home to internal migrants from the 50s and also from 80s on the forced migration, Kurdish forced migration. And the neighborhood became surrounded by gentrifying neighborhoods and it became um, place for displaces, marginalized groups, and it has a historic, it is a historical conservation area where there's a complicated property structure and crime that act, acted so far as a barrier to gentrification before this uh, new renewal law. It has 2,200 people living and mostly Kurdish, half, more than half and high tenancy rate, high unemployment, and um, the cent its central location, access to informal labor market and, and cheap rents work as, as the poverty alleviation mechanisms for the poor living in this area. Okay, Talibashi was among the six designated renewable areas in Beyoğlu, which was announced in 2005, and then 2006, municipality had the right to urgent expropriations um, that was declared and um, the plan is to make hotels, luxurious houses and, urge, um, and office spaces and um, as for the provisions for the, for the local residents, three options are provided for the property owners, 42% of current floor pla place for the, for the property owners or right to buy a mass housing um, Toki House is a mass housing um, house, let's say, um, in the peripheries of the city. And the third is the monetary comp compensation. Uh, for tenants, right to buy a house at this mass housing complex, again, is provided, but only for the formal tenants. And occupiers and informal tenants, nothing is provided. So I wish support from the... Um, suffered from disinvestment for years, which helped to develop a huge rent gap in the area. Yet there were barriers to investment, 
such as multiple ownership structure and crime that I mentioned. And this renewable project, led by the state itself, is pushing reinvestment to close this grant gap. And the announcement of the renewable project resulted in increasing housing prices around the renewal area as big international and national developers competed to invest in the area. And if we start with the, the residents' experiences of how the neighborhood changed in time, and reference goes to Özlem for this photo. For all residents, the pressure of displacement increased heavily as the pace of, pace of um, renewal accelerated. As residents moved out, the ones who stayed felt less at home. And this was first due to the fact that their neighbors were gone and the community feeling was gradually eroding. Second, due to the increasing numbers of evicted houses, they did not feel as safe on the streets as vacant houses became occupied by groups from outside the neighborhood who were involved in different activities. And above all uncertainty about what would happen to them caused anxiety among the residents who stayed in the neighborhood. And this drastically changed the, um, the atmosphere in Sardavish. Likewise, the landlords did not invest in the neighborhoods, which caused um, further deterioration in the buildings, and it made it less livable. As a result, Tarlovich deteriorated further, and people less fell at home in their houses and, and neighborhoods. And the threat of displacement increased as the municipality started demolitions. As the shadows of bulldozers fell over the streets and houses, it became more tangible for people that they would be the next one to move out. And you can read it in Erin's a renter unable to work who stayed um, till the end of the proce process in Tarlovich. And as for the appropriation strategies, I discuss appropriation strategies under two topics. First, how different tenure groups experienced the threats and harassment by municipality and private landlords. Second, I discuss how municipality used its power over information and time to put pressure on all the, the residents. The standard procedure for formal tenants was that, that they would be expected to sign an eviction paper once their, formal, um, once their landlord made a deal with the municipality. And if the tenants would not sign these eviction papers, then the GAP, the private um, company investing in the area, as the new landlord, let's say, uh, would send them the notices informing of double and triple rent increases. And if the tenants would not pay these amounts, then they would face the threat of eviction um, court case. So this um, chain goes on like this. The deadlines on the eviction papers were extended for certain people but not for others. Clients of these relations were involved and others were threatened by cutting off um, electricity, water, uh, water and gas if they didn't li uh, leave on the eviction due date. And in addition to that, um, one third of the informal and formal tenants were under the pressure of their old landlords who actually sold their properties to the new developer, but still kept to, to ask money, to ask rent from their renters. So just like the, this is the part to the renters, tenants, just like the tenants, the property owners also faced a range of threats and harassment. The municipality is right to expropriate the properties of the people who didn't agree with the, with the terms of the project was the biggest threat. And this was used in addition to the threat that they said that if they wouldn't sell for this price, then the eviction court case would, uh, would set a lower value than the, than the money that they, would, that they were offering to them. So this was another extra legal measure to, to threaten people. And um, upon these things, there were also the, uh, the pressure on the, um, the local shopkeepers, regardless of their tenure, um, financial officers and municipal police coming and checking their business licenses, permits they needed to, that they needed to operate their businesses. Okay. So the second part of this appropriation strategy is is related to how municipality used its power over information and time. 
It was five years after its announcement in 2005 that the project was actually started. According to the initial plans, the project would be completed in 2010, which still hasn't started. And besides, during the times of general and local elections, the process just was suspended for, for political concerns. And all these years, residents of Tarlabashi waited in uncertainty. The property owners first experienced uncertainty about the renewal plans, which triggered waiting with raised hopes that they would get some um, benefits from this project. And then they went into anxious waiting during this um, juridical process of expro expropriation because they were not satisfied about what was offered to them, actually. And the fear of losing their homes, shops, jobs, neighborhoods printed, uh, imprinted this, this anxious waiting. And among the tenants, initially expectations were high as the municipality had initially declared that the tenants, even the informal ones, would be covered under this, this renewal compensation uh, program that they were talking about. And the time, as the time progressed, it became clear that the tenants would not be included, compensated. On the contrary, they would be physically removed. And there were remorse about the timing of the evictions, and they waited for the evictions, which were constantly delayed. So this anxious waiting, we can um, reference Budio that implies submission. Feeling powerless against the landlords and the state, and waiting for others' decisions or the lack of them, imprinted tenants' experiences of this anxious waiting or living under the threat of displacement which took from like 2005 to 2011, the end of the year. So, before questions, I don't know what happened to my conclusion slide, but um, this paper investigated how, um, this presentation, let's say, um, how the residents of Tarlabashi lived under the threat of displacement through the account of experiences of the, the changes that happened in the neighborhood and also the, um, the appropriation strategies of the, the state and the landlords. I will not summarize the findings, but let me say that it shows the, um, the importance of inserting temporality into the analysis of, of displacement, and rather than doing post-move or pre-move analysis, it helps us understand the making of state-led gentrification, and the, especially the role of state and its partners who put pressure on people living under the threat of displacement. And having said this, I want to make some um, links, connections to, to, the, to the points raised before. That, um, first of all, I think going back to Tom's session, I, I try to tell the, basically the experiences of people, like the story of experiences of um, of people living under displacement, and it talks about the change, the neighborhood change, from disinvestment to reinvestment. Actually, the reinvestment is not there yet, like everyone has been evicted, still waiting. And these stories, we need more. Like conceptualization about this process, we need more. And the role of the state as the second point seems to be very crucial, especially in understanding cities like Istanbul, Beirut, and that also connects us to, um, to see how um, different roles state takes in different contexts, and also in the, in, the, in the locatedness of it. And the third one is mostly about the, um, the conceptual gap I was thinking about while writing, the, the, the, while writing my PhD, indeed. Like this is what I called as the, um, as the pressure of displacement that the municipality and the, um, and the landlords uh, put on the residents. But this is also different than displacement pressure as, as Peter Marcuse conceptualizes it. And I think it offers another debate that we should just think about further conceptualizations about displacement and also links to um, the rent gap theory. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bahar. I now uh, introduce my, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Uslim uh, Unsal. Uh, 
who also talks about displacement of residents in Istanbul under the title No Liberty on Your Own, Grassroots Movements and Urban Politics in Istanbul. She focuses on citizen and community mobilization as resistance to the pressures of displacement and state-led urban transformations. Uh, Dr. Onsal is an active urban researcher working on neighborhood and resistant, uh, neighborhood resistance uh, uh, movements, um, neoliberal policies, analysis, and rights to the city. Her PhD is on comparative analysis of neighborhood movements in two poor uh, neighborhoods in Istanbul. Dr. Onsal, please come to the floor. Um, hello, um, it's great to be here. I'd like to thank each and every member of the organizing committee and the team. This has been a splendid experience so far and I'm, I'm hoping that everyone over here is enjoying uh, the time we're spending here together. So um, this is an image from a demonstration which took place in December 2013, Kent meeting. It was a meet, the, the, the urban meeting in Istanbul, uh, which brought different uh, fronts of urban opposition together in protest of the ongoing um, schemes in the city. And, and what was happening was that the anger of different uh, groups was being expressed out on the streets. What you need to understand, I think, from here is that um, Istanbul currently looks like a massive construction site dotted with half-finished residential blocks and high-rise towers, um, big infrastructural uh, projects, shopping malls popping up um, in close proximities to each other. You don't get the you know, economic logic behind it, just one after the other. Um, and very little green and highly limited open spa spaces where you can just sit and do nothing. I mean, um, I was sitting on a bench one day and the police came to ask me whether everything was okay. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that this happens very often, but it happened to me, so even the idea that, you know, can happen, you know, every once in a while is just not good. Um, okay, um, all these changes became possible um, with the effective use of new legal and administrative tools devised by the state uh, within the span of 15 years or so. Uh, so today, I will be talking about a process that is strictly in parallel with these developments, that is the growth of an active oppositional coalition in protest of current urban policies and schemes uh, that have shaped the landscape I just defined. It is true uh, that when it comes to struggles over housing, public spaces, urban resources, or in general uh, on the city, we have never been able to talk uh, of a coalition of such scale and visibility in Turkey. Uh, however, this coalition, which is currently capable of taking hundreds and thousands of people out on the streets, is still facing uh, many challenges to uh, achieving many of its uh, goals. Um, as the government adopts um, increasingly oppressive um, and single-handed approaches to uh, governing and organizing uh, political, social, and economic life, chances of attaining um, satisfying results within the realm of uh, civil rights struggles get slimmer on an everyday basis. Yet these groups still manage to generate and accumulate a very particular kind of knowledge that is able to travel from one place to another um, and uh, make contact with other channels of struggle too, which is very important. Uh, so what is important today is to talk and discuss openly about the weaknesses and strengths of urban oppositional movements as much as their meaning and importance so that we can improve and enhance the models and tactics we use in our fights uh, for the right to the city. So to go back to the beginning of the story, I'm not going to give you uh, all the, um, you know, legal complexities and changes and reforms behind the scene that I'm going to... I think we're all li like loading this up on Tolga, whom I cannot... Uh, he's sitting there. Hi. Uh, so you'll do that part of the job. Um, but to go back to the beginning of, st of the story, um, as urban development um, became increasingly integral to Turkish ideals of economic prosperity, it has been inevitable 
for the definition, function, and value of urban land to become a central concern not only for the political and the business elite, but also for the wider stakeholders of the city, meaning their inhabitants um, and non-governmental organizations, and of course, um, many other uh, divisions. The increasing spillover of entrepreneurial activities on public spaces, dilapidated inner city neighborhoods, and informal housing areas out on the urban periphery um, do not only pose threats to the natural and historic as assets or the sound functioning of the planning system anymore. Currently, what is under risk, as argued by oppositional groups, are also the rights of citizens to the city in its broadest sense, ranging from the right to access public resources and spaces on equal terms, um, and the housing rights uh, of particularly the most vulnerable uh, communities under the conditions of new urban restructuring. So what is being witnessed in Istanbul is a proliferation in the number of actors that actively protest the further extension, extension of capital into the cityscape. These actors range from professional chambers to civil initiatives and neighborhood organizations. Professional chambers um, and unions have um, been actively criticizing the uh, decisions and actions of central and local governments since the 1980s when uh, project-oriented uh, metropolitan governance um, took off for the first time uh, in Turkey. Similarly, a bunch of grassroots organizations, that is, beautification associations, as we used to call them in the 90s, uh, were in operation to perform a local defense uh, of neighborhoods ag against aggressive uh, urban plans. What constitutes uh, the main novelty today is the accompaniment of these actors uh, with neighborhood associations that form as a result of the growing mobilization of socioeconomically and legally vulnerable communities living in areas pressured by forces of state-led urban transformation. So in a way, we can say that the geographies of opposition are expanding and varying in parallel to the expansion and variation of decisions and plans that aim at the overall transformation of Istanbul. So looking at the debates of the past decade, we can observe certain commonalities among the main arguments of oppositional actors, and I believe that these commonalities actually constitute the uh, core of the, uh, you know, what we tend to call uh, urban opposition in Istanbul. So, uh, to name a few, um, privatization of large tracts of, of, of public land and the expropriation of private properties for the initiation of transformative programs is taking place against the grains of public interest. Um, well, this was highly debated when the National Highway Authority's land was sold to a private developer for the construction of a mixed-use uh, development, residential slash, you know, uh, business, uh, you know, oriented, um, you know, structure that we tend to call Zorlu Center today. Um, another one, non-inclusive methods adopted in the decision making and project development processes give way to an extremely anti-democratic uh, urban sphere. Uh, again, this became a hot uh, topic when Solukule was demolished and rebuilt in the absence of uh, the community's needs and demands. The third one, projects envisaged pose vital threats on heritage zones and natural reserves. Uh, the ongoing construction of the third bridge on the Bosphorus is a good example of this since hundreds and thousands, an entire forest has been uh, destroyed for the construction of this uh, much expected bridge, which is going to solve nothing when it comes to the traffic problems of Istanbul, if, if you ask me. Um, and ask me and Japanese engineers. I mean, I mean, I may not be the expert, but Japanese engineers are, I, I would like to think. Um, the very same plans and projects breach a number of legal and normative frameworks, such as the Building Act and conservation laws, and international agreements that Turkey has signed up to, um, as, it happens, uh, as it happened in the case of Demiroran shopping mall, uh, whose renovation severely conflicted with existing conservation laws, and 
last but not the least, the way in which urban transformation is taking place, conflicts with the measures of social justice at many different levels. Um, on the one hand, injustices occur as people's access to public spaces or resources become limited due to top-down decisions. Uh, as it happened in the case of Haidar Pasha, a main train station which is currently, which is currently you know, closed and will be converted into a massive hotel within the context of a tourism area. Um, and on the other hand, this argument is grounded upon what is particularly being experienced in residential areas um, that have recently been exposed to radical renewal and transformation plans, as it happens in Tarla Bashir, which uh, Bahar, um, explained earlier. Um, to understand more specific objections re raised against neighborhood scale renewal, one needs to look at the standing point of neighborhood associations, which I will start referring to as NAs you know, in the rest of the presentation. For as long as the new mode of urban structuring has been underway, um, NAs in the informal housing areas of the urban periphery and poverty zones of the inner city have been trying to develop strategies against large-scale regeneration projects and visit for their respective neighborhoods to prevent dispossession, displacement, and other ill effects of um, urban transformation projects, which I will refer to as UTPs from now on, because there are too many long words, and I have very little time. Um, and I should also note that um, the development of these strategies and models by NAs are sometimes assisted by civil initiatives and other non-governmental organizations, um, depending on the case. Well, the reason for the concentration of NAs uh, in these specific locations that I define, namely the dilapidated inner city areas and um, uh, the informal housing areas of the urban periphery, is that um, current transformative processes do not only focus on uh, prestigious areas in the city center which are already hot commodities in the existing real estate markets of Istanbul um, uh, but also at um, but also they focus on central and peripheral areas that have failed to integrate with rent generating mechanisms due to socioeconomic physical and legal disadvantages due to legal ambiguities poverty and physical decay well um, the NAs are um, on a similar page with, uh, with other categories of urban oppositional movements, as you can imagine. Um, uh, but due to the specificity of their position within the ongoing processes, NAs also protest the following, which I'll start talking about. And um, as I touch upon uh, a number of points, I'll try to support my points by extracts from a manifesto released by uh, the Istanbul Neighborhood Associations platform in 2005. Unfortunately, this platform has ceased to exist. We can talk about the reasons, I hope, in the coming moments. Uh, but you will see extracts, and this, those extracts are coming from uh, the manifesto I'm talking about. So, uh, matters of concerns for NAs. Um, projects are legitimized through the active stigmatization of residents' communities resident communities by state authorities. Well, the NAs are critical of the highly stigmatizing language and discourse adopted by authorities that aim to legitimize and justify the decision for transformation. Previously, uh, Sulukule uh, was pointed out as a freakish place by the for former prime minister and current president, Tayyip Erdogan, and other destinations uh, were described as hotbeds of terrorist organizations by um, you know, mem other members of authorities. Almost none of the projects envisaged are designed to better the living conditions of resident communities. Here you can see some of the before and after um, images of uh, uh, renewal areas. Well, Tarlabashi has not happened as yet. Well, that over there, so look, the after image is real, believe it or not, it's there. Um, I mean, it's sitting there. Um, well, the inhabitants are never involved in the planning or decision-making processes or projects envisaged for their neighborhoods. Rather, they face top-down projects that almost completely raise and restructure their neighborhoods and eventually give way to their displacement. Another point, property ownership is central to policies at work. 
Well, the key to engaging um, in formal talks and negotiation with authorities is the title of ownership. Uh, so whereas pro pro property owners have a certain degree of say during talks and can se secure like, or guarantee certain gains such as financial compensation or the opportunity to stay within the renewal area, tenants and unrecognized um, settlers or occupiers remain unprotected by law at many different levels. Here, um, yeah, I think I've written um, the uh, signpost over there says we want our title. These people desperately need their title. These just to be able to have a you know say within uh, within the process of talks. To be honest, <coughs> although that might not necessarily mean get like uh, the benefits that you might desire. Projects tend to lead to the forced and large-scale displacement of resident communities. Well, it is quite typical for authorities to argue that uh, UTPs will not cause displacement. No one has to go. We are not asking anyone to leave. Well, however, this is hardly the case. Uh, transformation areas and their surroundings are almost instantly affected by speculative rises in real estate uh, values once the news spread, not even the news, the rumors, uh, spread regarding the initiation of projects. Thus, it becomes financially challenging for the majority to stay within their neighborhoods. And you don't even have to wait for the finalization of the project. The rumor is out, and time passes, and the, you know, the speculative rise becomes you know, real. It reflects on the uh, property markets quite quickly. Uh, so those few who take their chance in staying need to be able to afford the rent gap between their old and new units, which is rarely the case. As for tenants, it is beyond impossible to afford the future rent figures. For the given reasons, very large uh, groups of population get displaced, often against uh, their will. Projects are not backed by support programs that can help immunize residents against uh, the potential ill effects of relocation. Well, this is a big concern, particularly for tenants who get transferred to social housing units elsewhere in the city. And when I say elsewhere, I mean somewhere 40 uh, kilometers away from their original settings. Well, there are not that many examples of planned relocation. Uh, but the examples of Sulukule and Ayazma are quite uh, telling. Um, experience demonstrates that those who are housed away from their original habitat tend to face inadequate job opportunities, inaccessibility to basic services such as public transport and hospitals, radical interruptions in their survival strategies and challenges in affording the payments of their new units because they have to pay for their new units. There's nothing as, um, there's no such thing as free social housing. It's, um, you know, uh, long-term pay payment plans uh, and uh, law, like uh, how to say, like uh, law credits and as such. Um, UTPs lead to large scale uh, dispossession. Another big argument of authorities is that UTPs will grant property owners with much more um, valuable properties, assets. However, the way in which projects are implemented of, often leads to dispossession. Either the owners end up selling what they have at the start of negotiations, uh, also with the effect of scare mechanisms used uh, by authorities, or they do so once the project is finalized and once the speculative rise in real estate values fully reflects on the property. The owners justify such, such action on the grounds of going for the best option available, or the awareness that they will not be able to afford the cost of their new un unit in uh, the long run uh, because they will be valuable, they will have to pay for security, extra costs and such like. Um, well, to conclude really, um, I truly believe that the joint oppositional will demonstrated by these groups positively and greatly contributed to the uprisings of June 2013 that is the Gezi incidents. Uh, this is an image of uh, uh, urban groups in uh, the Gezi park uh, at the time of the uprisings. While I do not think that the uprising was solely grounded upon tensions over urban matters, I believe that 
active opposition put forth by these groups over the years has helped people develop an understanding of the relationship between the crisis and discontentment in the realm of rights and freedoms and the spatial crisis of the past 15 years to a very good extent. It is also important to note uh, more specifically that so far NAs have taken noteworthy steps in delaying the initiation of UTPs through legal victories, uh, reinforcing adjustments um, to the terms and conditions of projects, and perhaps most important of all, contributing to the growing public awareness with respect to the impact of UTPs. This is of great importance since, since it becomes possible for other neighborhoods in need to benefit from the information in circulation. If you want to talk about the rewards of opposition so far, this is currently what we have at hand. Yet at the same time, this is a picture from Fikir Tepe, and this was the house of the only um, owner who, who had not yet negotiated with the developers. Uh, it, was, um, it was coined as the last remaining castle in an area of uh, renewal. Um, as I said, yet at the same time, the wide range of urban oppositional movements are facing some fundamental challenges on their way to achieving further <laughs> results. Since the only agency that is potentially capable of negating the actions of local and central government is the main opposition party in the parliament, the movements can only be expected to build effective resistance me mechanisms that can minimize the destructive effects of current urban policies and operations. However, as I said, rather practical and fundamental matters are challenging the abilities of movements greatly. In the case of NAs, for instance, we observe that the efficiency of mobilizational skills can radically differ from neighborhood to another, or the recognition of property ownership as the sole ground of talks and negotiations over UTPs leads to fragmentations within communities, which threatens the unity of resistance. Last but not least, communities, communities suffering from social and economic drawbacks are unable to cope with pressures exerted by policies and projects at work. Well, um, in the aftermath of Gizi, one of the big questions hanging in the air was whether it would be possible to form a political party out of the Gezi spirit. Or, in other words, could the Gezi spirit ever translate into the form of a political party? The expectation was to gather political demands that seemed to be fragmented among different groups upon a single platform. Um, with the same spirit, more specific questions focused on the possibility of joining the forces of urban oppositional um, groups under a single umbrella. I personally do not think this is practically possible at the moment, based on my observation uh, on both the actions uh, of civil initiatives and NAs, whereas there are in irreconcilable di differences between the methodological outlooks of different initiatives which comes in the way of joining forces, NAs face more practical issues which prevent them from literally coming together. I, I was previously talking about uh, the Istanbul Neighborhood Associations platform. Well, uh, one of the main reasons why it ceased to function within the span of three years was because they could not the neighborhood could not come together. They had taken very uh, practical decisions and vital decisions such as in the moment of demolitions, you know, one neighborhood will rush to the other and, you know, come in the way of bulldozers and such like. But members of the community were saying, well, I need to work in the daytime and I, I cannot afford the transport expenses from one end of the city to the other. And you know, uh, these kinds of incredibly practical issues can really come in the way of forming, you know, uh, you know, how to say, more extensive um, coalitions. Moreover, uh, as urban transformation becomes more inevitable in legal and administrative terms, resistance evolves from being a firm stance against transformation to an effort to guarantee certain gains and securities for some groups. Is it absolutely essential to join forces though? Again, I do not believe so for the time being. New models and tactics are being experimented by various fronts as we speak, and the process of learning from each other is still continuing. Yet, if there is a wish to build stronger coalitions or resistance for the future, we should recognize the challenges 
and weaknesses and be willing to talk about them more often. Um, thank you for listening and for your time. Okay. Um, our third speaker is Dr. Mohammed Shahid, uh, who will talk about uh, the right to housing in Cairo, uh, resisting gentrification and the neglectful state. Um, taking the rich context of Cairo, Dr. Shahid will take us through reflections on the factors in play in the Caribbean context, be it political, economic, or social, using three cases of resistance to gentrification and displacement uh, taking place. Using these evidences, he will evaluate the relevance of the right to the city discourse in the Egyptian context. Uh, Dr. Shahid has a rich inter interdisciplinary background relating um, architectural theory to politics. Um, as he did in his PhD, completed recently, he is an urban activist as well, who established and edits the uh, urbanism blog, CairoObserver.com. He is currently a fellow at the, at, at the Berlin-based Forum for Trans-Regional Studies on Art, Histories, and Aesthetics uh, Practices. Dr. Mohammed, please. So um, thank you very much to the organizers. It's always a pleasure to be back in Beirut. Um, I have to start by uh, saying how envious I am of Turkey every time I hear speakers from Turkey and the richness of it, the urban activism scene there makes me feel very sad about the state, in, the current state in Egypt. Um, um, I mean, I remember, for example, before the, uh, the recent coup d'etat, we tried to organize uh, a, a stand, a protest outside of the municipality against the uh, violent transformation of the historic part of the city and we gathered about 50 people, half of whom were already friends, a quarter were probably uh, bystanders and another quarter were probably police informants. So it's a very different situation from what you just described in, in Istanbul. Um, I wanted to begin with this image which is actually from Berlin where I live currently until the summer. Um, this is a graffiti spray painted uh, on a wall in a neighborhood um, that's now hip and popular, gentrified, uh, Neutron uh, Kreuzberg, uh, that had been uh, occupied mostly by um, Turkish migrant families and some middle class, uh, I mean working class uh, German families in a part of formerly divided Berlin uh, that's, um, let's say, further east uh, of West Berlin. So nobody really from the middle class, white middle class German families wanted to live there. Of course, this is changing, and there's something ironic about the term being sprayed in English. Uh, it's never in translation. Gentrification, in a way, has become a brand or even um, a currency of its own that hipsters like to use uh, when they sort of like to show off how cool they are. They all have to criticize gentrification, even though they are themselves gentrifiers most of the time. Um, so I want to contrast this um, with an image um, that I took two months ago in Aswan, uh, Egypt. Um, to me, this is the architectural manifestation, or uh, let's say counterpoint, of that graffiti um, in Berlin. This is what gentrification means in, in Egypt. Um, the problem is that there is no name to it uh, locally, uh, and there's nothing off the cuff or ironic about this. Um, uh, so to my eyes, this is the architectural counterpoint to, to the graffiti in Berlin. As I said, it's the spatial and visual signifier of a process of urban change, which in this case entails the violent remaking of the physical environment um, paired um, with the aggressive transformation of class structures of a neighborhood. Um, this is, for example, um, an interior of a home that I was able to just peek my camera through the broken window. Uh, I can still sort of get a sense that somebody had lived there not, um, not until too long ago. Um, and many other homes uh, in this part of Aswan in the urban core are in various stages of demolition or collapse, um, and they're being replaced uh, by things that look like this. Um, so, so as a starting point, I just wanted to make clear that um, there's, there is no uh, accepted Arabic term in colloquial Egyptian that can describe what we're looking at while carrying the same connotations embedded in the word gentrification. Um, so I wanted to make clear from the very start that there is an important linguistic challenge here uh, when certain urban processes have names 
that are circulated, engaged with, critiqued, refuted, and even embraced and defended by various stakeholders, these processes not only become visible, but they are available for public discourse beyond the confines of academia. In Egypt, processes that we can identify as various forms of gentrification uh, are described in Arabic with words like the ones Tom listed yesterday, tatwir or ta'mir, so development, tansiq, improvement, islah or i'adat ta'hil, rehabilitation, um, or more popularly, just the sort of generic istithmar, an investment. Um, so these words conceal the often destructive uh, social and economic impact of certain processes of urban transformation. Uh, and there have been some attempts by various activists to translate or invent a term like gentrification in Arabic, in Egyptian uh, colloquial Arabic. Um, the most notable of these is jantara, which uh, as, you can, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine from the way it sounds, uh, it's an Arabization of an English word that without an extensive footnote really means nothing. Um, so, I, I wanted to start with this because I don't know if this issue has been really expressed enough, but um, there's really a linguistic problem here. How can the urban poor resist an urban process um, impacting their cities and neighborhoods that doesn't have a name? Um, <clears throat> so while gentrification doesn't have an Arabic equivalent um, that allows us to then engage with it critically uh, and discuss it in public or even you know, ironically spray paint its name on a wall. Um, the many symptoms of the outcomes of gentrification uh, often do have names. Uh, most importantly, Ikhla uh, al-Qasri, which is forced eviction. Um, in fact, a report was um, recently published by um, Amnesty International on this particular topic in Egypt. Um, so forced e eviction is a common practice in Egypt today, um, often administered by state institutions uh, and usually with the help of the police, and more recently, more so, uh, more often, uh, with the help of the military. Um, and forced eviction is about housing, and it is linked to various forms of gentrification most of the time. Uh, and I'll come to some of these uh, possible forms in a minute. Um, so, <clears throat> so in a way, um, the idea of the right to housing um, comes, uh, let's say, within activist spheres as a response to forced eviction so it's kind of uh, the response is to one of the symptoms of gentrification as opposed to, let's say, gentrification itself. Um, um, okay, so, so of course, again, and let me just stress that uh, this process of forced eviction um, often is part of a requirement to remove certain urban populations in order to clear uh, a territory, again, where the state is playing sort of the role of a middleman between uh, well, abusing its power to facilitate uh, access by investors uh, to certain uh, lands. Most of these investors happen to be from the Gulf. Uh, we live, I mean, we're in Beirut, where Gulf capital has had its own share of impact. Um, and the same is happening in Egypt at various de uh, degrees. Um, so in order, um, so in this context, I think the notion of right to housing can be a successful maneuver to resist gentrification. Um, I guess if we only kind of position it in the right um, context. But first let me quickly map out what I have identified as possible typologies or forms of gentrification happening in Egypt. Um, the first uh, and I think most common uh, form of gentrification looks like this. This is in Port Said. Um, you can see this is in the old uh, city core uh, of the city. If you're familiar with Port Said, it's a rather compact city. Um, and it was planned from scratch in the 19th century. Uh, so a building like that clearly doesn't belong. It clearly replaced something that looks like the one in the foreground. Um, and there's all kinds of corruption that grows into these kinds of um, constructions. Um, so the story with this kind of uh, transformation is often that a contractor who is always, or most of the time, is also the investor, uh, buys an old house or a building that's often dilapidated due to redlining that's uh, imposed by the state, um, which makes it difficult for owners to fix and repair their own homes, uh, making the owners vulnerable to offers by investors con slash contractors who then buy the house, tear it down. Uh, if it's on a heritage list, uh, we see it happen all the time. It actually gets removed from the heritage list because often these contractors have links with the municipality and they exchange um, money and, and who knows what else. Um, 
So the house gets demolished and replaced with this larger building, raising the property value significantly. Um, and these buildings are actually relatively cheap to build, considering their scale, because buying the old house was not that expensive. Labor is, is very underpaid in Egypt, very cheap. Uh, and often material is also acquired from various sources that makes it uh, somehow affordable to these cr uh, contractors. Um, and of course, when you compare this to the new square footage that's being produced, uh, there's always a huge a profit margin. Um, so I just want to, again, stress that this is happening across the country. And if you look aesthetically at the architecture, uh, it's actually very hom homogeneous. In a way, Port Said, um, um, maybe if I go back. So in a way, Port Said, Aswan, Cairo, <laughs> I love this image. Um, um, and this is Alexandria. Um, somehow, all with time begin to blend and look the same. Uh, you can tell all of these red brick unfinished uh, buildings in the back. Again, this is in a, at the center of the city, in part of a city, in the city that was prestigious at one point, Azarita. Um, and all of these, uh, as we like to call them, Khalazit, uh, are popping up. Um, and uh, replacing an old uh, building fabric with, with new properties that significantly transform the, uh, the neighborhood, but also um, put you know, em enormous pressure on uh, a falling apart infrastructure. Um, so enough of this form. Of, so this is one, and I would say this is the most ubiquitous and probably the most destructive. Um, so this one might be a bit controversial, but I would propose to say, I would propose that we also consider this as one other kind of form of gentrification, which happens on the urban periphery. What happens here is that you have small landowners uh, who, whose land has also been depreciated due to state policies. Uh, so sometimes you would have a farmer uh, with his family living in a small house, and then they farm on the rest of the land. Uh, but due to um, successive policies uh, that have made really uh, farming in Egypt kind of a, a fight um, to survive, uh, many farmers are enticed to sell their small piece of land to investors who are also small investors coming from other provinci from provi provincial cities that have also been depreciated and deflated. So they come to Cairo or Alexandria, those two big cities, for example, to buy a small piece of land on the urban periphery to build uh, property that could potentially bring them profit. So in a way, it doesn't really fit our understanding of gentrification. It's happening on the urban periphery. Agricultural land is involved. But I would like to propose as a, as a possibility that we also think of this as one possible form. Um, another form is perhaps more familiar, which is um, when the state is directly involved. So here you have Al-Mu'ez Street, uh, one main spine in the center of the old city that the state has sort of carried out this very expensive renovation project along, along the way evicted or somehow intimidated and forced out many of the original residents, whether in shops uh, or in residential buildings, and replaced them with desirable occupants. So for example, a lemon market or a lemon cellar, which has been there for centuries, uh, the idea of selling lemons in a certain part of the street becomes kind of not really cool or tourist friendly, so they're kicked out and they're replaced with shop after shop selling shishas to tourists. Of course, we don't have tourists, but the shops are probably run by people who are linked to the state, so it's not like there's a real market. You know, when there's no clients, um, people are not selling, then the shop closes. It just stays there, and nobody's buying, and nobody's really benefits. benefits. So in a way, it actually kills uh, the life of the street. Um, so you have this form, but you also have these sort of grandiose visions where the state is directly involved. Uh, that really aim, that are on a much larger scale, like the Cairo 2050 plan, the brainchild of which is now the very sad housing minister uh, in Egypt. Um, okay, so another form of gentrification I think is also relatively familiar, which is uh, for investors to go into uh, an old neighborhood and to invest in some of its properties to renew them uh, and to raise their market values. So this is an example from downtown, for example, where uh, you know, I think where the discourse about gentrification in Egypt has been mostly focused on this, even though I think this is kind of actually, uh, let's say, a fringe phenomenon compared to what, what I described in the very beginning. There's very few investors doing this kind of thing. There's one uh, famous one in Alexandria called this, uh, Stanley, which not enough people are talking about. Emirati money, dubious Egyptian partners buying up properties and actually destroying them as opposed to repairing them. Uh, often, than often, here you have a Smalaya. Uh, the painted building is state-owned. Uh, 
so the insurance companies are also that are state owned are part of this game but I think this is one form that we can somehow uh, compare with other examples um, around the world uh, and sometimes it also involves building new properties so for example on this particular piece of land right there um, on Tahrir Square a massive hotel and um, office building is being built um, on, on the downtown thing I just as a side note I would just want to note that in the book that Tom mentioned yesterday, I have a chapter that describes sort of the prospect of gentrification in downtown, so this is a possible reference. Um, a fifth kind of uh, form of gentrification that's happening um, is large-scale neighborhood uh, sort of uh, plans. Uh, and so this is, for example, the Maspiro Triangle. This is one vision who I had no idea who drew this uh, or who came up with this, but it's one of many visions for this particular part of the city. Uh, and I'll come back to the Maspiro Triangle at the end of my talk. Um, but in all of these possible forms of gentrification in Egypt, uh, they all depend on, to some degree on what can be identified as the ne neglectful state. Um, uh, uh, W.J. Dorman uh, used the term in his 2007 Suez uh, dissertation. Uh, looking into urban management under the Mubarak regime uh, and after 2011 he argued that the politics of neglect which had which has long governed um, uh, Cairo's expansive uh, informal spaces uh, looks uh, set to remain well into the post Mubarak era of course the policies of and the politics of neglect are not you know limited to uh, the informal areas it's really citywide uh, across the country and others have even used the term neglect to describe other uh, f other issues such as for example small farmers going back to the example that I gave earlier um, so the politics of neglect uh, um, uh, in urban Egypt are fundamental to the production of shells which again we heard about yesterday uh, in the urban core anyone who has been to Egypt uh, should be familiar with the dismal condition uh, and the lack of maintenance of many uh, of the buildings in the urban core, uh, particularly those built uh, before the 1970s. Um, in many historic neighborhoods, residential buildings, uh, building renovations are simply illegal. Um, a violation of this redlining would lead to one year imprisonment and a fine of 10,000 pounds, about $1,400. Um, so let me now shift uh, a bit to some of the activism in a way that tries to engage with this reality and resist it somehow. So for example, uh, in a 22-minute film, uh, Egyptian anthropologist and urban activist Omne Khalil um, shows clearly what, kind of red um, what this kind of redlining means to, our, uh, to real urban communities. So I'll go faster. Um, this is Amrida, who lives in an area known locally as Khoukha. Uh, near uh, Bab al Wazir at the bottom of the citadel. The area was damaged during the 1992 earthquake, um, and the state has made it difficult for residents seeking to repair and upgrade their homes. As a result, many homes have partially or fully collapsed, and families have continued to live in the remaining spaces, sometimes an entire family in one room. Um, so, this gives you an idea. This is a, a screenshot from her film. Uh, the poor physical condition of the area is a direct result of state policy, yet it was cited by the state as a reason for why the entire neighborhood needs to be demolished. Um, and then the people would be moved about 40 kilometers out into the desert in uh, poorly serviced housing uh, complexes uh, with no services, no uh, transportation, and so on. Um, so you have people like Amrida, who is very vocal, and in the film you, re you actually hear a resident speak about very logically about you know the problem with with this formula with what's happening um, so the discourse uh, of the right to, the, uh, to housing and the right to the city appear in the work of activists such as Omni Khalil as a form of resistance to both the neglectful state but also ge gentrification potentials uh, so this is Omnia. I think it's important. Uh, I wish I had pictures of massive protests, but we have individuals uh, who are doing very important work. Um, she also works in um, Romlet Boulet uh, near the Nile, uh, north of the city center, where also residents have experienced pressure from authorities. And when I say pressure, I mean middle of the night kidnapping of young men and random arrests um, and even the use of lethal uh, force. Um, in order to push the people out to allow the investor who owns the towers to, occu to occupy the land and develop it further and so on. Uh, so again, the discourse of the right to housing is a form of resistance that has been um, deployed by Omnia. Um, but I think uh, overall, 
it is a relatively new sort of discourse. Uh, and while there are several rights, uh, several rights organizations in Egyptian, uh, such as the Egyptian Center for Civil and Legislative Reform, that have taken up um, urban issues recently, I would say that the credit to uh, the credit of bringing the right to housing as a, as a discourse into the Egyptian scene goes to Yahya Shaukrat, who is with us, and hopefully he'll be able, he'll engage with us during the discussion to speak more about his work. Uh, he runs the um, Shadow Ministry of Housing, an online platform and initiative that has produced several important articles, studies, and short videos. This is a screenshot um, from one of them um, that engage with the public and raise awareness about the idea of the right to housing. Again, to sort of give people the weapons they need to resist. Um, otherwise, if we don't have the language, we don't have the methodologies, then how can people resist? Um, for the remaining time, I want to very quickly, because I know I'm all, already uh, almost out of my time, uh, go back to the example of the Maspiro Triangle, which I would say is one of the few successful examples in which a discourse of right to housing and right to the city has been deployed to negotiate and, let's say, uh, minimize the initial plans um, for a major gentrification project. Um, and here I need to thank um, architect, also activist, and researcher Ahmed Zaza for allowing me to use the, um, the following images. Again, here's Ahmed. Um, so, I can't go into too much detail, but it is suffice to say that this triangular area has been, direct, uh, has been occupied since the late 19th century. Um, and uh, since the 1930s, there were visions drawn up uh, to transform it. Uh, there was a film made about it in 2012 that I would recommend, short film, uh, Bulat in the Shadows of an Unfinished Revolution. Uh, this is a plan that was drawn up in the 1930s to redesign it, to sort of make it part of downtown, uh, which is a much more affluent uh, district directly south of, of the Mosquito Triangle. Um, this is another vision that was drawn up in the 1950s, basically to do the same thing. These were not realized uh, because of various for, uh, complications, but in the 1950s, the military government was able to actually evict uh, a significant part of the land to build uh, some new structures, such as uh, the TV and radio administration uh, building. And until today, there are cuckoo plans that are being drawn up all the time, often by consultants who are part of um, state agencies, such as the GOPP, or uh, faculty of architecture um, uh, at Cairo University. Um, so in light of all of this, um, people like Ahmed Zaza and his initiative uh, called MED uh, have attempted a parallel participatory project uh, to reimagine the design of the area uh, of Maspiro, working with communities, and eventually they made their voice heard enough that they have been brought in by the post, I don't know what to call it now, revolution, coup d'etat, whatever just happened, uh, in Egypt, a ministry that was established for the development of informal areas. Um, and, and, and so they sort of actually became partners, um, and they re imagined what could be done with this uh, piece of land. Uh, and this is what they came up with, which seems at the moment to be more or less the final vision. Um, the yellow area would be uh, allocated for residents from, so okay, I have to give some quick numbers. There's about 4,000 families uh, in about 1,100 uh, property, I'm sorry, 4,000 units uh, in about 1,100 properties. 2,000 of the units are actually one room. Uh, which means an entire family, sometimes more, live in one room. Um, uh, so the housing stock in much of the land is not so good. 14% uh, of the buildings already collapsed after the earthquake. So people do need better housing. And so the plan that they came up with is that they would be relocated to the yellow area uh, part of the plan. Uh, investors will have access to some of the land. Investors already own the majority of the land, believe it or not, due to complications. Uh, and the work that was controlling this area, so about 85%, I think, of the land is already owned by Kuwaiti and Saudi investors. Um, um, anyway, so what they've achieved is actually some sort of negotiation that's very different from that very first image what, that we saw with the, all these glass towers somehow sort of landing from space onto this piece of land. Um, so I just conclude, since I'm out of my time. Um, Okay, so, so I think this is one example in which the right to housing and the right to the city was used effectively to resist gentrification in Egypt. But I would say that despite the small but significant success, um, the potential for, the right, uh, for a rights discourse in general to transform 
uh, very violent urban processes in Egypt is still premature and exclusive to a handful of activists and organizations. You probably met everybody already in this presentation who's actually using this term <laughs> as, a, as a form of resistance. Um, so also in a context in a country in which basic human rights are constantly violated where the right to remain alive is constantly being uh, trampled upon, uh, a rights discourse about housing is still, uh, needs a, still needs a lot of work in order to sort of generate the kind of popular support that we saw uh, in the Turkish example. So I'll, I'll end here. Thank you.